Welcome to Science at FMNH, a podcast and video series that explores the behind the scenes science, collections, and research at Chicago's Field Museum. An ecosystem are all the biotic and abiotic components in an area. It kind of varies depending on how big of an area you're talking about. If you're talking about the Amazon basin, you're talking about three quarters of South America. If you're talking about wood falls, which is what I study in the deep sea, you might be talking about a piece of wood a foot and a half long, or even something as skinny as a pencil on the same level. The, the term is somewhat flexible. So it's all of the organisms that live in a given area, plants, animals, fungi, bacteria, everything, and the environment that they live in. So water is obviously a crucial part of that as well. So it's a term that we can define in a variety of ways. As long as we define what we're talking about, then it's clear. Yeah, I'm Rudy Gabila. I'm curator of invertebrates at the museum. I'm responsible for the collections of animals that do not have vertebrates, uh, with the exception of all the terrestrial arthropods. But uh, we take care of mollusks and crustaceans and corals. I'm interested in the biodiversity of South Florida, and particularly the Florida Keys, that string of islands that essentially runs south from uh, the area of Miami, is connected by bridges all the way to Key West and then extends into the Gulf of Mexico by a, a chain of islands that ends in the Dry Tortugas. Probably the most dramatic impact uh, was the construction of initially the railroad bridges in the 19-teens and then later they were replaced by uh, car bridges, uh, automobile bridges. Before these bridges went in, the hardest substratum for an animal or plant to sit on were essentially mangrove roots and a few little patches of, of fossil reef. So putting in these enormous amounts of, of concrete have changed the environment considerably. Suddenly the organisms that like to sit on hard things, on dock walls and bridges, uh, found a, a substrate that they never had before. The majority of the molluscan species that we look at are smaller than a centimeter. We have some species down there where the adult size, the adult shell size, is a third of a millimeter. So uh, those things can only be found under a microscope. And then we have, you know, queen kongs and house kongs and large animals um, that you would not find in a little grab or in a shovel of sand. So um, what we have done is lay out a series of transects, imaginary lines, essentially from the intertidal to about mm, a depth of 700 feet. And then we've collected along those lines at regular intervals. Now we have a very large collection of sediment, the animals that we've sorted out of the sediment. And we also have a good understanding of what we saw alive and what we only saw as, as empty shells. And that's one of the advantages of working on, on mollusks. Each of the shells has an almost complete record of the skeleton. So in contrast to most other animals, the baby shell is still attached. The baby skeleton is still attached to the adult shell. So we know what it looked like and we get a better understanding of what kind of larval type it had and, and how it might have lived. Along the island chain of the Florida Keys, you have a barrier reef system and those reefs are about mm, five, six miles offshore. There is uh, heavy use of, of those coral reefs by snorkelers, divers and fishermen. There is the pollution factor from boats or cruise ships or yeah, you know, dropping grey and, and uh, potentially even black water in, in those regions. Part of the reason why the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary was put in place and also part of the reason why the sanctuary put exclusion zones into place where there's no fishing and uh, no tourist industry. So we can actually compare more or less pristine habitats, or at least habitats that are no longer being used, with those that see a moderate use. But for each of the species that we know that's there today, we can go back and say, yes, it was there in 1896 because it was in the Carnegie uh, collection at the time, or it was at the Smithsonian at the time. 
or it's in the Field Museum collection at the time. So we're tracking these things through these historic bits. When we look at these historic collections, we find um, that some relatively small collections with good documentations that were put together a hundred years ago are extremely valuable. A single shell is essentially an interesting and, and perhaps beautiful mental piece, but if you have 10 or 100 specimens of the same species, they begin to tell a story. What museums like this one represent is a library of data that we can mine to figure out how drastic have those changes been. This is one of the few places where we can actually physically go back in time to a given location and pull open a drawer and see exactly what was at that location in 1850 or 1912. And we can compare what we saw yesterday to those two different times and see if there had been any change. And we can use these patterns that we're observing to test hypotheses. Has there been change? If there has been change, what, how drastic has it been? What direction was that change? And what are the reasons for that change? 